We're back on the road this April with our live show, Cocaine Cowboys. If you want to hear the story of Ireland's love affair with Colombian powder and those who made millions in the gold rush, join us in Galway's Town Hall Theatre on Saturday 6th of April, Killarney's INEC on Saturday the 13th of April and in Belfast's Waterfront Studios on Saturday the 27th of April. Tickets from venues or at mcd.ie. I often wondered about a lot of these IRA men you hear of and, you you know, you go through their career and there's so much violence involved, obviously. Um, different times there was, they would say they were fighting a war for Ireland. But there's an awful lot of really psychopathic, violent people that were attracted to it. That might sound like something really obvious. Mm. Um, Pierce McCauley had violence in him in his fight for Ireland, but he also had violence in him, which had nothing to do with that. He attacked his own wife, stabbed her and uh, multiple times in a drunken rage or whatever it was, they had split up and he'd gone over to the collect his children on a Christmas Eve morning. Um, he shot dead, guarded Jerry McCabe, which was part of a robbery and I don't think was necessary violence. No, I mean, he, it's, it's very interesting when you look back on it. I think if you see, um, after the ceasefire, there was obviously a huge amount of people involved in the provisional IRA. Um, you know, of course, not all these people were psychopaths, um, you know, and once the peace process began, a large number of them, possibly even the majority of them returned to something like a normal life, um, despite everything that they had gone through. However, there was also um, a large, a significant number of people who uh, could not stop being violent, I suppose. And Pierce McCauley would have been one of the most high pro- profile examples. He was a very high profile IRA man, uh, really from the, from the 1990s. He probably, um, he, in 1991, he tried to, es- he escaped from Brixton Prison uh, in the UK uh, after somebody had sent him a gun in the post and he managed to break out. In a shoe. In a in shoe. Post. Yeah, which is incredible what when you think about it. shoe for? I don't know. I mean, I suppose it just, it got a gun into him. One um, shoe. One shoe, I think. A gun in, hidden <gasps> in the sole of it. Right. And, you know, so th- if you're talking about somebody at that sort of high level risk taking, he was already in, in, you know, he was already in prison, obviously, for a, a, an attempted murder attempt. And then he arrived back in Ireland. And at this point, obviously, the, the you know, the IRA campaign was beginning to wind down, I suppose. Um, and in particular, at that point, the provisionals had largely ceased operations in the South of a type. So during the 80s um, and the 70s, they'd, the, the provisional IRA had carried out a large number of bank robberies. They'd also carried out kidnappings. Um, for example, Ben Dunn, where Ben Dunn was kidnapped and a rem- ransom was demanded. But it did at the stage in 1996, when Jerry McCabe was, was shot, they'd really tried to um, not do these things publicly at the very least. Um, they were on the road to provisional movement towards being a political road, really. So the the shooting of Jerry McCabe, um, as you said, it became one of these really complex things where is this an unofficial IRA operation or an official IRA operation? You know, ignoring the fact that all IRA operations were in theory unofficial, you know. But obviously Jerry McCabe was shot dead and it was one of those killings in, in Irish history that had a huge, huge impact. Um, it's the same year, of course, that Veronica Guerin was killed just some months previous. And there was an effort to charge the four with murder. Yeah. But due to witness intimidation, uh, they were convicted of manslaughter in the Special Criminal Court. But what I wanted to kind of try and delve into a little bit before we go into yeah. the nuts and bolts of what he's done is, you know, you have an individual like Macaulay. He's attracted to the IRA. Yeah. They're attracted to him. Yeah. Because they don't really want, you know, at a time of war, they want people who are capable of violence and of carrying out, you know, wartime, they will call it atrocities though. Yeah. Nonetheless. Um, 
the people you're talking about that walked away from the IRA in the aftermath of the peace process would say that that's what they fought for. Yeah. And they really were, to my mind, proper soldiers, you know, of whatever it is, whether you... Yeah. You, you, so you don't have to agree with what they did or what they didn't do, but they were fighting for equal rights. They were fighting for for an Ireland where they, where Catholics and nationalists had a, you know, equal position and where they were being, they saw it being ruled by an outside country, Britain, and they were being treated like shit in the end of the day. They were up in the north. And you speak to those IRA guys and they are very deep thinkers. They're very political, intelligent people. And they thought what they did and what they sacrificed was for their grandchildren and their children to grow up in a totally different environment, a better place than where they did. But then you have this whole raft of extremely violent essentially in a different environment, they would have just been criminals. Yeah. They were attracted to the IRA because it gave them weapons, it gave them something to do. But, and in a way, is it similar to, you know, the Catholic Church wasn't in place to attract paedophiles, but it bloody well did because of its setup and because of the power it gave adults over children and, and because of what it was. Yeah, it's it's a very complicated mix, I think. I mean, political ideology was there and that was driving people to some extent. But there's no doubt there's people in in all societies that have a capacity for violence. And if there is an outlet given to them, whether it be even sort of state-sponsored violence you see in other countries where you have people joining armies and committing acts of violence, um, there's no doubt that the, the, the terrorist organizations in the north gave some of these people an opportunity to commit violence. And if you look back on on all of those organizations, there was always a number of people who clearly qualify as psychopaths mm. that got mixed in with them. If you look at, say, the Shankill Butchers um, involved in, in the UVF up the north, I mean, these, these people were cold, clear psychopaths. There was a number of people... Take knife. Yeah, there was steak knife in the IRA and then steak knife in, in the British, you know, his role in the British Army. But that also followed through. There was some exceptionally mm. violent people involved in the INLA and it's very hard to look at them and say they were driven by a socialist Republican ideology. Pierce Macaulay, um, you know, maybe the, 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 what is it, the test of the pudding is in the eating. I mean, after he was, his, if you remember, he was imprisoned for uh, the, the, the death of Jerry McCabe. And then it became a big political issue whether the killers of Jerry McCabe um, were entitled to be released under the Good Friday Agreement like the rest of the uh, IRA prisoners. Um, and both he, Michael O'Neill, Jeremiah Sheehy and Kevin Walsh, who were his co-accused and convicted, were all given massive backing from Sinn Féin. They were given massive backing for Sinn Féin. Um, the government didn't want to let them out, saying these were a different case. Ultimately, um, they 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 were released. Um, the Sinn Féin continued to campaign to say these were no different than anybody else who had been involved in the conflict and um, that you can't, I suppose, let killers out up the north and say they're, that that was part of the troubles and these guys are different because it was, it was you know, it was a guard that killed in, 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 in a different circumstance. So, I mean, when he was ultimately released, he was, of course, met by Martin Ferris, who, who was a Sinn Féin TD. Um, and, um, now, that was six years after he was granted special release to marry a Sinn Féin councillor called Pauline Tully, who had been into prison on some... I can't remember exactly what it was, yeah. but she had met him in Castle Ree prison where he and his other co-accused were living in, in houses on the grounds. Um, you know, they were given that special yeah. dispensation within the criminal justice system. Um, but she had met him in prison. They had fallen in love or whatever, and she'd married him while he was in prison. Yeah. Now, a Sinn Féin counsellor, and I have to say when the court case came up, I did speak to her briefly. Um, we'll get on to that. But a very uh, gentle yeah. sort of a woman. Articulate, yeah. Really, really lovely natured woman. Yeah. Really, really, I'd say, you know, all full of good intentions, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's easy to look back and think, you know, 
who did you think you were marrying? Yeah. You know, did you think you were marrying a, 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 another, a, a man who had fought a cause for Ireland and not a violent man, but clearly she did. She married him in 2003 and in 2009 is when you're talking about Martin Ferris showed up collection from prison. And basically the British government abandoned their plans to extradite him back yep. to the UK. And he fell into a marriage with Pauline Tully. They had had children or certainly have children together. Um, so that marriage didn't work out. No, because, um, you know, Pierce. Macaulay did, did not become, uh, uh, you know, uh, a productive member of society. Let's put it that way. And there were signs of that. Um, even in the prison system, he did not have a reputation. As some IRA prisoners became academics, wrote books and plays. Pierce Macaulay was not of that type. He was, we always heard that he was somebody who threw his weight around within the prison system. Um, when he got out of prison, uh, he became, he was a very, very heavy drinker. He was certainly somebody who was in and out of the pubs, shooting his mouth off, all of that sort of stuff. And obviously... Um, and threw his weight around at home. Uh, obviously we found, yeah, exactly. Obviously we found that, you know, when when it did come to court, you heard, I mean, it wasn't, not that any level of domestic violence was is acceptable, but he he literally could have killed that woman. It was terrifying. It was absolutely one of the most terrifying cases I think I've heard. Yeah, you know, and I have been to a lot of cases. Yeah, but the detail of it was just you know he was supposed to come on the Christmas Eve twenty fourteen to collect the kids. Um, still had access to the kids, and they were sharing the parenting of them or whatever. And he showed up instead two hours earlier, absolutely pissed. Yeah, and started to attack his ex-wife at that stage. I think he punched her in the face as soon as she opened the door, got her into the kitchen and with a knife stabbed her yeah. 13 times yeah. and left her for dead. She had to, there was that, I think she managed to get out and call her brother or some neighbour called her brother who basically came over to find him. He had her pinned into a car. She had sought refuge in a car. He was still trying to go at her again and I think her brother managed to overcome him before the, the police called. But he not only tried to kill her but he tried to do that in front of their children and she later spoke about how one of her sons had seen through a window in the kitchen or through a door in the kitchen him actually physically plunging a knife into her abdomen. Um, and she said at the time and in the aftermath of that court case that she was never going to not live in fear again for the rest of her life. This animal yep. sort of emerged from the man she had married. Um, I don't believe that was the first time he had shown violence or certainly threatened her, but that was the kind of culmination of um, a marriage that didn't work out. So Macaulay was sent away for... What was that? Was it 14 years he got that Something time? Something like that, yeah. It was a hefty yeah, sentence. Hefty like, sentence, yeah. Because, um, so then he went back into Castle Ray, Ray ultimately. Um, he wasn't uh, at this point being housed with, with uh, dissident Republicans for the most part. Um, he wasn't put in, for example, Port Leash Prison for a lengthy period of time. But again, once he got into Castle Ray, um, he was throwing his weight around. He also became, I mean, he was charged with uh, drug dealing, I think, while in the prison, which is, you know, obviously the provisional IRA, which he had been a leading member of, really looked down on any drug dealing. So I think he was charged in relation to relatively minor amount of prescription drugs, but he certainly um, remained involved even in prison in a certain amount of criminality. Um, I suppose uh, during this time, um, we found out much, much later, of course, that he was getting a regular uh, visit from another now disreputable character, I suppose, uh, Jonathan Dowdle. Mm. Came out, of course, during the Regency Hotel trial. Came out of that, the Regency Hotel trial. So, I mean, Pierce Macaulay ultimately got, got released. Um, but, but Dowdle, just to go back to that yeah. for a minute before we, we go yeah. on, Dowdle was uh, visiting Macaulay. I think he'd visited him 14 times. He admitted to yeah. under cross-examination to having seen him once or twice. But basically when you, 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 I mean, we were there listening to the evidence of what happened that day in the Regency, but also the aftermath of 
the sort of the Hutch organised crime group, as the state were saying, trying to get rid of those Kalashnikov yeah. weapons and the AK-47s rather and get them up to the north as a kind of a, a piecemeal offering to dissidents who they wanted to step in and stop the feud between the Kinahan and the Hutch organisation, step in as peace brokers. It was all very extraordinary evidence to listen to, very interesting to listen to how, you know, the two sides of that feud saw the role of the distance, saw the power of the distance. Clearly the Hutch organised crime group or Dowdall representing them believed they had the power to tell Daniel Kinahan to back it up. Kinahan certainly wasn't in any way, shape or form going to meet them. But Dowdall was like Macaulay emerged from all that story and all those people that were met and Hutch himself, Jerry Hutch was brought up to meet uh, the the real IRA, uh, our new IRA, real IRA, yeah, Jerry, pick what, what's pick. his name again, Mellon? Tom, Thomas Ash. Thomas Ash Mellon. So, I mean, you could see... And others in the darkness of the night. Yeah, so I mean, in the in, it was actually ahead of the Regency Hotel, Jonathan Dowdles, uh, I think it was in, in January, the Regency occurred in yes, February 2016. Free and April, yes. Yeah, so Jonathan Dowdle had gone up, according to Jonathan Dowdle, so you have to take everything with a pinch of salt. He'd spoken to Pierce McCauley about um, attempting to resolve the Hutch, the growing hutch Kinahan feud. Whether, we, whether that occurred or not, we'll never know. Um, then he said, um, he in the aftermath then, he arranged a meeting. Uh, he got Pierce McCauley to make a call and Jonathan Dowdle can be heard talking. Uh, obviously, Jerry Hutch's conversation with Jonathan Dowdle in the car were bugged and they're heard talking about Pierce McCauley and Jonathan Dowdle gives him a glowing reference and says Pierce McCauley can sort it all out and Pierce is going to speak to to we um, and they speak about a guy, Kevin O'Neill as well. And Pierce McCauley obviously acts as a kind of... Uh, a, fixer, is he? A fixer, really. Yeah. Now at this point, of course... While in prison, I mean, how odd is in, that? While in prison for beating up a, a, a woman who's a, a Sinn Féin representative. Um, and he's still acting as a fixer at that point for with, with these dissidents' organisations. And it certainly um, seems to have their ear and their respect so that shows you, I suppose, that, you know, that network still existed at that point. And Pierce McCauley was still somebody that was certainly not uh, regarded as being beyond the pale. He was still regarded as a man that was worthy of respect, that could put these two, in theory, powerful organisations together. Um, and that's... Jonathan the- Dowdall was a bit embarrassed about having met him. He was fu- On was a personal fu- level, I thought, <laughs> as well as kind of, you know, obviously he didn't want to discredit... Yeah. yeah, I mean, he got a terrible time actually over over it because he, well, he uh, lied. He lied. So, like like a lot of Jonathan Dowdle's lies, um, they were kind of silly lies that were going to be caught out because he insisted he met him maybe twice in prison. He called into him twice, but of course, the defence merely applied. To he insisted prison. after denying he knew him at all or yeah. had be- yeah. visited him at all. It was only when he was hit by Brendan Grehan for the defence with the uh, the visitor's log. Yeah, but see, that... Even then, prison. Yeah, even then he'd said, oh, I might have met him. Twice, then, yeah. Yeah, and then it, it merged, like, again, 14 times. Yeah. And, you know, he spoke about his conviction for for domestic violence and said, oh, you know, I don't judge people. And it doesn't really make sense that the dissidents fixer would be in prison because it's a place where, you know, there's, you know, for people who are so paranoid about being listened into and, and et yeah. cetera, how do you do any business? Well, I don't know if you... From prison because obviously the visits are monitored. Well, they're not supposed to be... Well, they are. I mean, they're monitored and they are. we all know that they're listening into phone calls and all the rest of it. There is an intelligence gathering network within the prison system, which is very effective. So why would you have your fixer in prison? Well, I don't think you... Probably a fixer is, is you know, what 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 probably emerged... He gave the nod, didn't he? To yeah, make, to probably let emer- what emerged is that he was a man that was considered worthy of respect in the Republican movement. And rather than being a full-time fixer, getting a wage, that he could still have that role with those dissident organisations, that he could still uh, give his, his you know, his his backing to something and it would have to happen. And of course, the dissident organisations came out of it pretty um, poorly as well. I mean, the individuals involved and the evidence that we heard from the, um, yeah, it was, the, the, uh, the bug in the car that they had arrived in this sort of darkened road to meet 
with Jerry Hutch, drink taken. They were a bit chaotic. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, like it certainly... It didn't come across very professional. No, it, it, the mystique of the, the all-powerful IRA was certainly... <laughs> was, suffered a blow. In, it did, it did. In, in, but, you know, exactly. So you just get the impression that there's a bunch of these alphalas, probably many of them like Pierce McCauley, who, who, whose days have been uh, really dangerous people are, are, are past them. But nonetheless, that's where he went um, after he got out. Pierce McCauley a couple of years ago um, when he got out of Castle Ray um, we pictured him getting out and then he went back up to uh, Straban to Straban um, where he was originally from um, nothing really was heard of him over the last couple of years um, until he till it, it, it emerged that he died um, it's believed he died of natural causes Um you know, a pre-existing health issue is being being mentioned. Though obviously, none of that is confirmed um, by by at this point. But that's that that is a sort of a, a sad and lonely end. Fifty nine years of age, and um, no doubt, um, his his ex wife Pauline Tully and the family of um, Jerry McCabe uh, don't. Well, like, any great happiness one way or another about his death, but I'm sure for his ex-wife, the idea, you know, if she was going to live in fear for the rest of her days, um, you know, she can rest easy that he he can never come for her again now at this stage. But it is interesting, isn't it? I mean, where where would what sort of life he would have been if he'd grown up in different political circumstances? Mm. What would I mean, he have been? You know what, what I mean? What would he have been? And would he would still he... have been a wife beater? Would he still have been, you know, a violent bully? in and out of the prison system. Um, well, you know, can, did the IRA and the violence that he carried out on behalf of the, you know, the the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, did that make him a violent man or was he a violent man drawn to the IRA because of what it allowed him become legitimately? Well, I, I mean, I would think, think that's the case. Mm. But like, it's interesting in this week we have, you know, we can, we can speculate that he might have always gone down that route. But, you know, he died within 24 hours, was it, of Rose Dugdale dying Yeah, in South Dublin. Rose Dugdale obviously um, had been uh, born in the most privileged background you could possibly have in the UK and it ended up being coming an IRA volunteer and carrying out a number of, you know, very uh, wild uh, criminal conspiracies on behalf of the IRA, including the the, the, the break-in and the stealing of paintings in Rusborough House. Would she, like, what, where did politics play a role in her? You know, she, would we say the same, that if 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 this the struggle in the North had never occurred, could she have lived a quiet life? As no, I don't think so at all. Sure, she'd been to Cuba and had been interested in various other uh, countries of strife before she kind of landed in Ireland. And yeah. Um, but it is it is interesting, isn't a, it, that the, those two yeah. people within twenty four hours? Look, we can't unpick, mm. you know, where politics starts and where people's individual personality begin. Okay, well, we'll leave it at that. Thanks, Nicola. I'm Nicola Talent, and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs, and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel. And turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.